well, I'm Tanya Pinkins. This is through a black woman's lens. I'm not certain if the trailer is streaming now. There it goes. We are a majority in this country. And we're going to win the election. Do you know what the red pill is? A red pill is someone who infiltrates a group and then destroys them from the inside. This place is spooky. Take it easy. You know what, guys? I'm going to go back tomorrow. I think we should call the sheriff's office. What is that? What are we doing, Miana? We die. But we take some of them with us. Thank you. Um, I'm Tanya Pinkins. That was a clip from my debut feature film, Red Pill. Um, which will be released in December through Midnight Releasing. And it was the um, impetus for me creating this uh, series through a Black woman's lens, which we are in partnership with HowlRound Theater Commons and so grateful to them for their support. Our first one was also co-hosted by uh, the Theater Communications Guild. And this is the fifth in a series of six. And I'm excited to have this conversation today about spirituality and sexuality through a Black woman's lens. Because when people listen to Black women, which they didn't do in my movie, <laughs> things work out better. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna start introducing my guests in no particular order. Um, first, I have Beatrice Wexby. Um, her pronouns are she, her. She is a Brooklyn-based general manager and event producer, originally from Brazil. Prior to her current position as general manager of the Broadway Podcast Network, she worked with various New York City theater com companies, including Foresight as the management associate and the associate general manager of Briar Patch Productions, and two years of experience as the company manager of Fuerza Bruta at the Daryl Roth Theater and the general manager at Nymph. And she's worked off Broadway shows, Cagney and Handle with Care. Thank you so much for being with us today. But you know, before the pandemic got down, Beatrice was introducing me to some stuff. So I'm excited to catch <laughs> up with her. Uh, yes, thank you for having me. Thank you. And then my next guest is Kaya Dunn. Kaya is an assistant professor and the head of acting at the University of North Carolina Charlotte Department of Theater and an affiliate faculty for theatrical intimacy education. She consults with actors equity on issues of race and theater. She's an actor, a director, an activist with performances in five countries. She's a recipient of a Kennedy Center National Medallion for her work on theater and race. She's performed nationally and internationally in over 40 productions, most recently the title role in Pearl Atlanta Theater's Atlantis Theatrical Outfit with Fit. She's published in the U.S. and has co-authored a chapter in Arden Research Companion to Shakespeare and Contemporary Performance, as well as the forthcoming co-authored chapter on Black mother schooling in Black women and the Rona. And then my thank you, Kaya, for being with us today. And then my next guest is someone who I am just meeting today, and I'm so excited and honored that she would share her time and energy with us. Her name is Kat Niambi. Did I pronounce that correctly? AKA the hungry medium. And she has a practice that is rooted in African spiritual tradition for which she is grateful. Without this tradition, she wouldn't be where she is right now. I don't think any of us would be where we are. For many of the gift of hearing spirit doesn't present itself in a way that's easily recognizable. She says that I was either lucky or my soul has been around the block a few times and has navigated this mind body iteration, AKA me, to where I am today, a clear audience spiritualist who's able to make connections between spirit and the physical world. She likes to think of herself as a spiritual activist using her mediumship to help others find direction, clarity and focus in their lives. The goal is to help you help yourself by tapping into your own power to problem solve and to work towards achieving actionable goals. You'll feel more empowered to design a life shaped by you and endorsed by the soul. Thank you so much, Kat, for joining us today. Thank you, Thank you for having me here. 
Thank you. Thank you. I want to say that I am um, coming to you from Panama, which is um, traditional lands of the Guna people, the Embera people, and three other indigenous communities that I don't know. It's one of the most biodiverse places in the world. I am a uh, brown skinned um, woman and I'm wearing a blue dress with gold embroidery, amber earrings. I've got my hair in locks and uh, a braid on the top and I've got glasses and some bright red lipstick. So uh, ladies, my first question out here or first statement that I'd love you to answer is, to me, spirituality and sexuality are on the same continuum. And the um, way we wanna separate them is the first place where we get ourselves in a little trouble. What do you all think about that idea? Um, I, I, yeah, I'll... I'll... I'll agree with that. I mean, a lot of it both, I think, is about connection and trust and consent or not or the lack of. Uh, so I, I definitely think that there is a strong connection. But I also, uh, I mean, in the, the whole sex and sexuality, there is such a huge spectrum into what the, how that plays into your life every time. And so in the same way that spirituality would as well. But I, so I definitely think that there's a big, strong link with the two. Um, and not, yes, and not, and not necessarily with religious, which I also want to like separate that from like, because yes, you have sexuality, yes, you have spirituality, spirituality, but that doesn't mean that the religion can play into both parts, but it's not necessarily connected to all of it. And yeah. Have to be. Yeah, I have I have two things. Uh, I agree with you on that. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I have two real things that I try to convey to people. And um, even though we're not speaking of gender, um, I like to just state for the record, you know, spirit has no gender. Right. And also the other uh, connection for me is that both require you tap sexuality, spirituality, both involve you tapping into your source, right? Meaning that, that that entity that wants to be happy and live a good life and feel pleasure and give pleasure to others, right? That's the pure nature and essence of spirituality, right? So I like to see them on the same spectrum. Um, I hope we get to talk about the fact that, uh, you know, we as black women, we as women, there's just so much patriarchy. Right? <laughs> and that is at the core root of us being eliminated from all forms of classic, you know, religion or spirituality, you know, uh, stories. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I hope we get into that. If we don't, you know, that's fine. But so I just want to remind us too. You will you know, remind us too. I hope so. I hope so. Thank you. I'll just say briefly, like many Black women, um, I practice the Christian tradition. And since I got a female pastor, uh, I've been able to have some really deep conversations around this. Um, and even before that, though, the idea that your body is holy and anything you feel you know, through that, or it can be holy, right? And I think I, I I come at this a little bit from a historical perspective. I do a lot of work on Black women, like how we've developed these tropes of Black women and intimacy. And so when you look at sort of the evolution of where people may have come from in our Indigenous countries or our countries of origin, and how sexuality and fertility was celebrated, right? Like you look at sculptures, you look at masks, there's, there's almost a holiness, since we're talking about black women, like around women's sexuality. And then you see as, you know, as we look at the slave trade and, and coming and respectability politics as a way of protection around the body of trying to protect women from assault and from things happening, this separation from the holy as it's something that's hush hush and it's something that was used to hurt and something that was used to attack and what I've seen happening for the past like 50 60 70 years is sort of this coming back together like to me it feels like a returning to um and you know there's a lot of fight against it but I'm excited to see what that returning to is like I see I teach so I see my students and young women celebrating themselves their bodies their feelings in ways that 
I know wasn't as, I think people still were, but it wasn't as visible uh, when I was, when I was a student. So, yeah. You brought up patriarchy, and I wonder if any of you all are familiar with um, Mark Twain's Letters from the Earth. Do you know that book of his? I just want to read a passage from it. Um, Mark Twain is one of, you know, considered one of America's very great writers, and I think he's a very fine writer. And he says, the law of God, as quite plainly expressed in man's construction, is this. During your entire life, you shall be under inflexible limits and restrictions sexually. During 23 days in every month, and the absence of pregnancy, um, wait a minute, sorry. During 23 days in every month, in the absence of pregnancy, from the time a woman is seven years old till she dies of old age, she is ready for action and competent as competent as the candlestick is to receive the candle, competent every day, competent every night. Also, she wants that candle, yearns for it, longs for it, hankers for it, and is the commander by the law of God in her heart. But man is only briefly competent and only then in moderate measure, applicable to the word in his sexist case. He is competent from the age of 16 or 17, thenceforward for 35 years, after 50, his performance is of poor quality. The intervals in between are wide and its satisfaction of no great value to either party, whereas his great grandmother is as good as new. There is nothing the matter with her plant. Her candlestick is as firm as ever, whereas his candle is increasingly softened and weakened by the weather of age. As the years go by until at last, it can no longer stand and is mournfully laid to rest in the hope of a blessed insurrection, which is never to come. By the woman's make, her plant has to be out of service three days in the month and during a part of her pregnancy. There are times of discomfort, often of suffering for fair and just compensation. She has the high privilege of unlimited adultery of all the other days of her life. This is the law of God as revealed in her make. What becomes of this high privilege? Does she live in the free enjoyment of it? No, nowhere in the whole world. She is robbed of it everywhere. Who does this? Man's statute. If the Bible is the word of God. Now, there you have a sample of man's reasoning powers as he calls them. He observes certain facts. For instance, that in all his life, he never sees a day that he can satisfy one woman, also that no woman ever sees the day that she can't overwork and defeat and put out the commission any two masculine plants that can be put to bed to her. Now, wait a minute, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. This is his life entrance in 5,000 freshmen, while hers is 150,000. Yet instead of fairly and honorably leaving the meaning of the law to the person who has an overwhelming interest and stake in it, this immeasurable hog who has nothing at stake in its worth considering makes it himself. You have hereto found out by my teachings that man is a fool. You are now aware that woman is a damn fool. What do you think about Mr. Twain? Wow, that's my <laughs> first reaction to that. What the fuck? That's a man talking about men oh. and sexuality and spirituality that, you know, are we have a capacity that they don't have, but they've said that God says we only get one and they can have many. You're muted, Kat. Yeah, I'm bothered by so many things. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't like uh, discussing um, little girls um, age seven or any age or any ages, <laughs> to be honest, about um, from a man in particular, about our capacity for anything. Um, it was really strange. I felt like I couldn't keep up with him. Like I couldn't tell if he was being a satirist. You know, I, I really could not tell um, because it was unbelievable. 
what he was saying. Um, but this is what I think was alluding to when I spoke about patriarchy. And this is what we're going through here in the United States, um, in most places where men feel like they have some sort of um, knowledge about us that we don't have about ourselves. And even they, they have the right to discuss our bodies, period. You know, I want to I wanna share something that uh, happened to me, an anecdote uh, related to that, that recently something just came up that brought it back again. Uh, many years ago, I had a very bad miscarriage that had a lot of medical mispractice and a lot of, it was not, it was traumatic in many, many ways. Um, and it took months and months and months. It was a very long process. At the end of that process, I needed uh, an emergency surgery. I went to the emergent, you know, the urgent care or whatever, going to the hospital. Um, it took them about 16 hours to see me as I was bleeding on the floor, all of that kind of stuff. And the man who did the surgery, I did not see his face. I was medicated when that happened. I don't know who that was. Uh, but I had to go back a few days later to go do like a check-in. And as I went to do this check-in, uh, I had this strange situation of going into this uh, OBGYN office where all of the paintings on the walls were of white man, this almost like, um, like Renaissance type paintings of white men that were important for medicine, looking very angry. And I said, well, I'm already in a bad place and this is making me extremely uncomfortable. And then I finally go in and he starts the, the conversation with, well, I don't believe in lubrification. So I am going to just put the little, whatever it's called, uh, without, using, without using any lube. And I said, but you just did a surgery. And as I was saying that he was already putting the thing in and I was screeching in pain. So after that happens, um, he is, you know, being just examining me and whatever, and it's extremely uncomfortable and my husband is there with me. Uh, and I am unable to really go up and down stairs at this point. I'm unable to really like walk very well, like I'm in a lot of pain. And so I asked him and I said, okay, doctor, so how long is it going to be until I get back to normal? And I don't, I'm not even joking. His answer was, oh, you know, if your husband wants to have sex, you guys can start having sex now. It's going to hurt a lot and bleed a lot, but who cares? And my husband said, who cares? Well, I kind of do. And I, at that point, went to a place of just complete disassociation. It was so abusive. And I could not believe that a doctor that treats women's health would say something so like a fucking rapist like I've never heard that I would never in in a place that you're supposed to be feeling safe and being taken care of to have that happen and I the reason I bring this up to is because not only because it kind of has to do with that of like it's about the man's desire even in even if you are going through these things it doesn't matter who cares right um but also because I recently, many, many years later, just received a bill from Batman. And I'm like, fuck <laughs> you, I don't want to pay you. Um, but yes, but, it, but it, that, that's something that was in my mind as you, was, as you were reading that was the whole, but who cares? It's going to bleed a lot and hurt a lot, but who cares? Mm -hmm. And I was like, mm. hmm. You know, you got me thinking we, the, the archaic Kelly verdict just came out. Um, I hadn't watched that documentary until now because I knew it would upset me and I didn't expect it to be a conviction. And, um, you know, one of the things people talk about is that he could get away with this because he wrote such spiritual songs. You know, <laughs> I believe I can fly mm. while he's raping children. Um, you know, that we know that there are many pastors and many priests who use their quote unquote spirituality as um, 
um, uh, to give them access to people who are vulnerable, who can be abused. I was watching mm-hmm. the documentary, John of God, the guy in Brazil, who Oprah was telling the world about who uh, raped upwards of three or 400 women over um, 50 years. So I think that with these kinds of things happening, it's very hard for us to be clear about our spirituality and our sexuality when they get so corrupted um, in, in our dealings in the world with some men. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that is where, at least for me and in my journey with it, was that was where I kind of started going into the like sex party and kink party world because I found that once I started going to those places, even if I just wanted to dance, I said, I just want to go dance tonight. I felt more comfortable and safe Mm. in that place where the whole idea is consent. Then I felt going to a club where the guys are coming and I said, like, I don't want to talk to you. And they're coming to my face. No, 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 no. But just a little bit. And they're (laughs) grabbing me before talking to me or they're coming from behind to dance with me. And then I would go to these places and people would go, can I talk to you? And I'll be like, I don't really want to. And they're like, okay, and turn their backs and leave. (laughs) And I was like, what is this world? And why have I not discovered this before? But you got to tell us what this world is because you were introducing me to it and I bought my ticket to go. What is this world? Um, it can be many things. I mean, like it is, um, it can be, it, it really can literally be anything, right? Because it's whatever, I think everybody is kinky in their own way. I, I think can mean so many different things, but um, in the, the kink community is, it's a very, is a very like worldwide can it's very specific depending on where you are too but uh there's different kinds of play there's different kinds of uh experiences and for people that want to explore kink there's a lot of ways to be introduced to it especially in those kind of party scenes that are that is less aggressive than just going to like something small or going to have a session with somebody specific um that you can go and just watch somebody perform something and you can be like, oh, that actually kind of looks interesting and that kind of turns me on or not. I'm like, I never want to do that. Uh, (laughs) But it's also a place where at least I feel there is that I feel safe and there is no judgment. And I feel very non-judgmental going into it as well. I'm a very non-judgmental person in general, but going into it, it, there was so much curiosity to me of being like, why are people into these things? Like, who are these people and why are they into it? And why is it so, and it can be anything from, you know, old men that dress like babies and ask people to change their diapers and that's what gets them, them off. Or, um, you know, rope play or uh, impact play. So using whips and pedals or people that like to be choked, people that like to be cut, people that like to, there's so many, it spreads so wide um, and finding a safe place to do it, because, especially because in porn, it is so wrong. Like it is shown so incorrectly. So when you're watching kink play in porn, it is so absurd. Like it is so horrible to watch. There is no conversation. There's no like, there's so much conversation that happens in kink that does not translate in porn so that there's negotiation, there is the aftercare, there is like all of these things that happen when you're talking about play and when you're talking about kink parties and when you're talking about uh, what that means to you. It's a lot of self-discovery and you and your partner or partners or master or sub or whoever it is that you're playing with to discover those boundaries and be vocal about them. Um, So there is this place of discovery and limits and boundaries. And a lot of people deal with their trauma by going to, you know, the kink world and trying to uh, face their traumas in a safe place. Um, So there is, I mean, the world can mean many, many things, but that's a little bit over. The thing that was interesting to me about it, you said that when you go to one of these places, you have to ask permission even to speak to somebody. That consent is first and foremost. You don't even say hello to somebody. You have to say, may I speak to you? Mm. And, and what happens is like, if, you, if somebody is breaking the consent and it can be even be like 
you're like, I don't want to talk to you. And then the person comes back and tries to talk to you again. You immediately go to the security and said, that person is not, did not respect me and broke my boundary. And they are mm. usually kicked out. Mm. So even if they did not touch you, because it, that is already breaking a boundary. So if, if you're saying, this is my boundary, do not cross it. And somebody's crossing, you can say something about it. So mm. you feel, so there is a lot of power in that and a lot of control to your own body and your own self mm. and your own sexuality in that world. Mm. Now, Kaya, you're doing intimacy training and trying to deal with this consent thing with what actors are willing to do in intimate scenes and mm. in shows, you know, tell us. I said, because there's so many of the same words for me, actually, I entered into intimacy because 98, 99% of the people doing it were white women and then some white men. And the discussion around race was, oh, we need to give scholarships so more people of color do it. And I was like, whoa, like race affects consent, right? So Tanya, you wrote that letter, the open letter last year about scarcity, about people being replaced. About, and like, we all know black women when they speak up, when they say, uh, I don't like this, we're considered, um, hostile or emotional or aggressive, right? All of the things, if we're not, people are trained to see us as caretakers. And so when we refuse to fill that caretaker role and we say, I need this, or this doesn't work for me, often black women, because that's what this conversation is, um, aren't seen as worthy of protection in the same way that other groups are, even sometimes white men, right? So when the Me Too discussion happened, it was framed a lot as like a gender thing, but it was like, oh, I mean, one of the things I talk about when I teach intimacy is like, there's a hidden history of white women as sexual aggressors. And people immediately think I'm talking about Emmett Till or false accusations. That's part of it. Um, when you read Mark Twain talking about the seven-year-old, the first thing I thought is there's um, an account of a formerly enslaved woman talking about how her white mistress would talk about six-year-olds because it was this perverse form of feminism where white women could pass their wealth. They kept their slaves, they lost their land to their husbands or their brothers, but they could keep the people that they were kidnapping and torturing. And so they became very good at literally breeding people. So they would, or if they wanted a wet nurse, like features, you started to talk about gynecology. That's a whole other thing. Like I've given birth to three small humans twice. I wasn't, mm -hmm. Well, I went and got a black midwife. I was like, I'm done <laughs> with doctors. Um, the lack of asking permission, all of this goes back. Like it, it's rooted in anti-blackness, right? Like mm -hmm. black, don't feel pain. We're going to gynecology was all experiments on black women. Right. And so when we talk about what consent means, if we're not talking about how all of these practices were developed, if we're not talking about the history of how, um, sexuality played into colonization, right? So negative sexual tropes about Asians and Latinas and black women and the hierarchy of who was closer to whiteness, right? Then we're not actually talking about consent because we need to peel all of that back. And it's not just a matter of saying, this is my boundary. It's also recognizing, oh wait, this is perpetrating a negative stereotype. But then also, even if we get past all that, how often do we see, um, Sorry, how often do we see Black women experiencing joy on screen in sex? Like even, I mean, there's some, I'm doing a book chapter on Black intimacy right now, right? So going back, and even some of the 90s films I loved, I was like, but these women aren't enjoying their sex. Like, it's, it's about how much the man's enjoying it, or they're happy they got the man, but they're not actually enjoying the sex. Like, we watched, I got together with a bunch of girlfriends and was like, oh, let's watch Waiting to Exhale, which in my adolescent mind was about black women enjoying sex. And then I was like, they're not enjoying the sex in this movie. Um, or even something like I loved Queen and Slim, but the sex scene is interspersed with violence. Um, and, and for a reason, but it's like, I saw six movies that year where every time you saw black people having sex, someone was being killed. And it's like, where's the humor? Where's the joy? Where's the laughter? Like all, I love that you use the word play so much Beatrice. Cause it's like, we don't ever, I, when I was growing like, when do we get to be soft, right? When we talk about spirituality, when is there protection? When is there um, freedom to express sexuality without being labeled, right? Without being the words I heard 
you know, fast, loose, da 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 da, da right? And so when we think about what does it mean to be sexual, none of us are free from the images that were given to us. Like that's a process of decolonizing our minds around not just um, like what does it mean in the world, but when we talk about spirituality, again, I'll talk from my tradition. My pastor was like, do you know how much more times justice is mentioned in the Bible than sex? But you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know that they say don't charge interest because we don't talk about that, but we talk about keep your legs closed, right? And so just like what that does to young women as they grow up, and then we tell them like, oh, but please, you know, please a man or please your partner or please this, or, you know, if you're, if you're, um, liberated, then you should enjoy sex. And it's like, but you have 18, 25 years of like negative messages and I'm supposed to enjoy it because I'm supposed to be liberated and I don't know, you know, and it's so messy. And I think a lot of that goes in, but I think there's a responsibility in the theater and in storytelling to really look at the stories of sex that we're telling because a lot of them are really harmful. Thank you, uh, Kaya. Kat, is there uh, something that you can offer about how Black women can enjoy their sexuality through their spirituality and remove some of the taboos that are in the Black community? Yes. Um, before I, I get there, because I, I thought about it today as I was getting ready to come on here, um, but I wanted to just talk back to uh, briefly about what you were just talking about and the fact that that patriarchy is rooted in white supremacy. And when you went from how white people are to how black people are, you have to look at the reason between, you know, we inherited this from them, right? Our men inherited these concepts from them as well. And this doesn't just happen in the black church. It happens in all, all forms of traditional religions. There's this elimination of, of the, the power feminine, right? So that segues me because we give birth, we give life. Do they give birth? Do they give life? No, two things give life, water and women, okay? So, <laughs> and then they you just erasing us from all the scriptures, all the books, everything you read, everything you read, everything you see on television. The segue to that is how do we as women start to, um, how, where's that bridge? Where's that connection? And I think that this speaks to every tradition you can think of is loving yourself, right? Loving yourself. I always talk about tapping in, right? But loving yourself in a sense that loving yourself, knowing firsthand what your body needs firsthand. How are you going to tell somebody else how to please you if you don't know how to please yourself, right? That means you have to be honest with what you desire, regardless of what it is, right? And not based on anything but the messages you've been getting, getting from your intuition, right? So I'm getting ready today. And in order for me to love myself today, I put on my favorite perfume because where am I going? We're in the middle of a pandemic right so we're in the middle of this and i don't i'm not going out to smell good for anyone right but i'm gonna put that perfume on to smell good for me and scent the art of scent is the the real way you get tapped into spirit that's why you have the palo santo that's why you have the florida water that's why you have all these things sage that have smells incense is so that we can imbibe with that smell. And you love it, right? When your house smells good, you love it. So what about your body? When your body smells good, you love it. You love yourself. So to me, that's the connection. Love myself first, then the rest comes later. That to me makes me think about the fact that, you know, there's trinities in life and nature. And I think that in this spirituality, sexuality conversation, we need to also talk about sensuality because sensuality is different than sexuality. And scent is definitely about sensuality. And also like the ways in which our culture is sensual, right? So one of the things I ask uh, people is like, what, what is specific to black intimacy, right? Because each culture has their own forms of intimacy. Sometimes people think like, we know we don't do, most people know we don't do colorblind casting, but they still think like colorblind intimacy. And it's like, no, if you think about a man sitting between a woman's legs, getting his hair braided, right? Like that's a form of intimacy. That's just in our culture. Um, when you think about 
uh, a friend of mine said, I think about a, a black man coming home at the end of the day and putting his head into a woman's chest and her mm. whole, right? Like that's something in our culture. You think about two women embracing and the ways in which, you know, our hair, our bodies, our shape, right? And all the, our rhythm, like our heart, there's um, a friend of mine from Malawi talked about, you know, Eurocentric culture tends to go here first and then try to understand it here. And in Afrocentric culture, you tend to get it here, right? And then- mm up here and it's a different way of moving through space mm. and different, like it's the drum it's the all and all of that is sensual in a way I mean, and what I'm looking at right now too is like where did that get separated and where did that start to become like oh we don't want to do that you know you even think about rhythm or dancing is bad or all of that because it makes you so powerful like Kat I love what you said about like when you love yourself and it's like I, I was talking to a girlfriend and she was like, how many billions of dollars are meant to make us not love ourselves so that we love ourselves? And she was actually talking about Effie and how much she loved that Jennifer Holiday song. But also, like, why is it that whenever we see larger, dark skinned black women, it's pain and it's it's loud. And, it you know, and she's like, I want it. I want soft and I want sensual and I want right. And, and like reclaiming that and reclaiming feeling good. I mean, I got to hang out with Tanya a few months ago and it was, you know, black women and black non-binary people together and it felt good, right? And I love that you separate the sensual from the sexual because it was sensual, right? I felt my senses um, and that reconnection I think is really important and it might even be the bridge between the two. And mm -hmm. I have, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I actually have one of my partners is, uh, a girl who's asexual, which it is for a lot of people very shocking to have like, you have a partner that you love, but sex is not really what it's all about. And so it's a very shocking thing for a lot of people when it's like, well, but we connect in so many more things and we love each other so much. And all of that intimacy and sensuality is there. And we'd rather be making out for like hours and have the like sexy connection than to just have penetration or to just have whatever type of sex that you wanna that you wanna have. We don't necessarily need that in in our partnership and in that relationship. Um, and I, and those are I again so separate. And going back to like the kink stuff too is like that is so separate because you do have what people would consider sex. It's, it's so also heteronormative of like, you know, penis and vagina situation, which is also absolutely stupid. Like, oh, you, lo you lose your virginity once you get a dick in you. Like, no, nah, not really. Um, but so like I, so th that belief of like, let's explore everything. But for me is so much more sexy and sensual and sexual than actual penetration agreed 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 i mean it, it, i want to say two things one is like i like to hold my girlfriend's hands there is nothing sexual going on but when i'm hanging out with girlfriends we will walk down the street and we will hold hands and it's just a lovely connection or uh, lock our, our lock arms lock arms and walk arm in arm and it's just uh it's a connection it's a a tactile kind of thing and I have told a many a man that that penis inside, that is for you. That is not doing it for me. Okay. <laughs> not doing it for me. I remember once I asked someone to just um, undress me, mm. put me in, tuck me in, bring me a cup of tea and leave. And it was one of the most sensual things it ever had for us because it was about someone just giving to me. It was tantric just the giving and just being able to receive without having to give back. Yeah. Oh, Tanya, you're going to love the parties. I cannot wait until you go. <laughs> <laughs> Do we get to watch that workshop? Because <laughs> I want to know what happens. I want a recording back. <laughs> so, um, Kai is from a Christian tradition. Kat is bringing the African tradition. Is it um, Ifa, Ifa? It's, um, it's Yoruba Lukumi 
tradition, but I grew up in the church. So I know all about church. I was in the choir. I was in the junior usher board. So I was baptized. So I know all about the church. Beatrice, are you, is there something culturally different in Brazil versus the United States in terms of uh, sexuality? Oh my God. Yes. A lot of it. Uh, Yes, there is. There's also the idea of the Brazilian woman in th- that the U.S. see the that, uh, that is like, yes, which is very much like, oh, this. And the thing that sucks is that I do fall into a lot of those stereotypes of like how I look and that I am a very sexual person. Like I do fall into a lot of these stereotypes that people have. But obviously none of my friends do. Like I am not the norm per se. And um there are a lot of different religions, obviously. My parents are, uh, they kind of, I don't know. My parents were like, kind of believe that the more religions that you believed in and try to learn about, the more you would understand how the world works and why wars happen, more or less. And so we would go to like this Buddhist guy and then half of my family is Jewish and then half of my family was Christian. And then, I mean, very, you know, Latin of us that is like the mixture of all of the different cultures and my grandfather uh, being from Africa and bringing the like the Zulu traditions home and like having the Portuguese. And so it, it's just such a crazy mix of religions and like having the candomblé and having like, those like that like spiritual religion and the drums and the how like involved with with your body that all is um and then you have like I mean my family was a very naked family too you know like they were all and they still are like we still are always and so there was always this this disassociation between body and sex that is like it's only become sex or a sex object if you wanted to Mm. Um, that I didn't realize it was weird until I moved here. And everybody was like, your brother sees you naked? And I'm like, yeah, why wouldn't he? Like one thing, being naked does not mean anything sexual at all. To me, at least, and for him, it doesn't. And we call each other, we look at each other's bed and we're like, oh my God, you look hot. Doesn't mean that I'm like, I want to fuck my brother. It just means that I can look at him and be like, you look great today. Like, as a friend or as a fellow human navigating the world, there is that separation. I think people in the West don't understand that one, (laughs) right? (laughs) The West is like, what? I mean, I certainly raised my kids that body is body, but I felt that same way about words. I'm like, there are no bad words. You can use any word in a way that is hostile and you can weaponize any word. Like, I, I think that I feel that way in terms of good and bad. It is a spectrum and we can take anything and weaponize it if that is how we are wanting, if that's our intentionality. And they were very, and, and I'm very grateful for the way that I grew up because my family was also very open about sex. And my mom and dad were the kind of people that are like, you're going to go play at your friend's house. And we're like, oh, we don't want to. It's like mom and dad are going to have sex. So you guys going to go play at your friend's house. <laughs> So it was always oh, this thing of being, and if we're like, ew, like we don't want to hear. And they're like, well, at least mom and dad are having sex. And that's why we're not divorced. <laughs> like let's weigh the options here. So there was always this like kind of blunt honesty that therefore when I was growing up and my sister is kind of the opposite. I wonder if she's hearing this right now. She's going to laugh because it's true. My sister is very much the opposite. She's like more quiet and reserved about that. She's like, oh, I don't want to hear about it. She still is a little bit like that because I share everything and I always have. So my mom and dad, like as a teen, they would be like, where are you going? I'm like, oh, probably going to try to have sex with that person. Mm. And I'm like, why? My dad would be like, why are you sharing this? And I'm like, because mm. you asked me and I'd rather be safe. Like if something happens, I'd rather you know where I am. Uh, so I always shared. And so I was, but it's, but it's not usual or common necessarily. It's very much of like my family and how they are. I don't think that everybody is like that. No, do you, I think there's a safety element to this though, right? So this is one thing that my mother did do. Like when I was three and I was like, hey, how'd you get pregnant? She told me and she was like, you probably should call at your preschool, right? And I, same thing, my son, like at four. And I remember like his dad's family was shocked that I taught him 
anatomically correct words, but I was like, for me, that's a matter of protection, right? If he knows like, this is my penis and it belongs to me and nobody else is allowed to touch it. And we're having that conversation. So much abuse happens at three, at four, at five, because people are afraid to talk. Children know, like my youngest son, he like, that's because he'll grow up one day and see this, but like kids like their bodies, right? And they touch them. <laughs> you know, and, and I would please themselves better than grownups do. So I would rather we talk about that, right? We talk about this is what it is. And I used to do a sex ed show in like LA and Southern California for middle schoolers. And I was terrified because I hated middle school. Um, but, but kids were so curious, right? So there were little girls whose mothers were telling them that you lose your period if you take a shower and you wash. And there was so much misinformation. And, but, and, and the way we sort of guided the sex talks was about like, when are you also emotionally ready? Because I think we so often talk about the physical and we're not talking to kids about like, this is what it means to emotionally connect with somebody, right? And so to have those conversations as kids were developing, right? And, and, and to be honest and open and to talk about it, especially in the black community, like here's how we talk about it. Your body is beautiful. You have a right to say no, or you have a right to have pleasure. You have a right to enjoy yourself, right? Like the idea that sex can be pleasurable for women as opposed to don't do it because you might get pregnant, right? <laughs> like that's such a different, you know, there's there's so many things that I think even if our parents didn't do it that are in the culture um, that we kind of have to fight through to even get to a place of like, oh, it's not bad to enjoy sex. <laughs> mm, yeah. I, I really feel like, um there's a lot we have to unlearn as a people. Um, I haven't probably been the best uh, example for my daughters because, you know, I'm, I basically taught them what I was taught basically is which, you know, I could kiki with my girlfriends, but always felt uncomfortable uh, talking to my daughters until now, because now they're grown women and now we have these open conversations. So they're probably more uh, mortified than I am when we have start having these conversations, but you know, to each his own, you just have to be yourself. And, you know, that's a part of our growth, you know, and um, the concept of the act, the concept, you know, there's a lot of um, linkages um, that can be made in regards to uh, sexual energy and psychic abilities, right. Um, and storing uh, certain sexual energies in order to eventually release you know, at a time when you're trying to divine and things of that nature. Um, I can say there's a drastic difference between my upbringing as a Christian and um, the Yoruba Lukumi tradition, because at the end of the day, um, we're all given like, you know, when you're initiated, you're giving them, you're given a roadmap about your life. And when they're divining this, they're, you know, unless the person grew up sort of like, you know, Puritan, <laughs> the person reading you, you know, we all come from a sort of Puritan. I'm not equating that to Christianity, although we could have that talk another day. I'm just saying that we have these plants in our head, regardless of tradition, about what's good, what's bad, you know, that have been, you know, uh, imprinted on us. So when you look at a religion um, like Yoruba, Lukumi, or Candomblé, where you're looking to a deity and God to guide you, they're not going to mince words about what you need to do in any areas of your life. They tell you what foods to eat. They tell you what foods not to eat. They tell you you need to have sex more. You need to find a partner. They tell you everything that you need for yourself. So the discussion around you know, the Orishas themselves, Shango had like three wives, you know, and, and, you know, lots of Orishas were marrying each other, right? So, and then also I come from a Pan-African and this may not necessarily have to do with sexuality, but I'm just giving all the sorts of, you know, uh, family constructs, you know, growing up in the seventies, I grew up with a lot of people that were in um, polygamous relationships. The the products of polygamous relationships. So these are also concepts, right? And constructs that may not have anything to do with the act of sex in whatever form it is, but also the way we view family units, the way we view relationships, period, 
right? And maybe, although I would like to say obviously, but I'm going to say maybe for some of you out there, we just have to open our minds to the idea that we're all energy orbs, right? Who are just trying to commune with one another and just trying to commune our energies. And if it's done through the human body in whatever form that unites those two orbs in, in union and, and really a spiritual experience, then you have to be able to see that, you know, these are things that are, are our source and our souls are seeking, not just from a physical standpoint, but also from a connection, connectivity of, you know, energy force uh, connections as well. I hope that made sense. Yes, it did. And I'm going to go in a little deeper on that. So, um, you know, in one of the, I'm, I've always been a person who was interested in many traditions because I think you have to know all the paths. And, and, in, and in one lifetime, you can't learn all the paths, but none of the paths is the only path or has all of the, the, the knowledge in it. And you were bringing up, um, you know, the sexual energy is the energy that created everything. And so, in one of the traditions that I've worked with, it, it, it even in terms of moving um, trauma or um, manifestation, um, there's a whole meditation that centers around using the energy of, uh, of, of, of sexual pleasure, of orgasm. Can you meditate on that thing that you... Uh, are so, so afraid of until you can energetically move yourself into sexual pleasure around the thing that you fear the most. Can you take yourself to orgasm around your pain, around your trauma? And that might sound terrible to somebody, especially if your trauma is sexual trauma, but it's about capturing this energy that is not good or bad, that has been corrupted by an event and, and, and taking your power back by reconnecting with that energy and transmuting it into the life force energy that it is supposed to uh, intended, I think, by the divine for us to use. You talked about polyamory. One of my friends was telling me like Atlanta has a huge polyamory community. I'm a little, you know, like on an intellectual level, I think you, I like it. Do you on mean polyamory or polygamy? Which one? Polygamy and polyamory are different. Okay, so which, which one? Y'all define them for me because I don't know. I don't know. Uh, polygamy is when you can, when you marry a bunch of people, when you can have, you know, the man that has a bunch of wives type thing. Polyamory is the... I would say sexual orientation, even though that's not necessarily correct, but is it is a people that can fall in love and have multiple relationships with multiple partners of different what, genders or any well, it, it depends on who you are. It, you can also um, so I am polyamorous and so is my partner. So is my husband. And so we have other partners in our lives. Uh, we do not date together and each person d does however they wish to do. Uh, but it is uh, each of my relationships is their own individual thing. It's not, we do not, we are not all together. We're not like, we're, we don't practice that kind of polyamory, which does exist as well, which is like, everybody is friends with everybody. Like we don't really necessarily, like we have met each other's partners and stuff like that and have like, be friendly with them, but we're not like, besties necessarily or haven't and it doesn't mean that it's never going to happen who knows um but we have other relationships that are meaningful and beautiful and fulfilling outside of our marriage mm, that sounds so mature I, <laughs> like wow we have a couple questions here um i want to i want to bring in i want to do this polyamory more because Here's the question before I get to these two over here. So if you have this, um, these different kinds of relationships, you said one of your partners is asexual. Um, what was the reason for doing the legal thing? Um, I think it can be different for different people. Also, we love a party. We got married three times. We're probably gonna get married again. Like we love getting married. Uh, 
but I think there is that aspect of it. There is the spiritual level of it. There is also the respect for like our families aspect of it. There is the tradition, like there is obviously the tradition, but my wedding was all sorts of like different because again, so many different religions and we got married on Jewish New Year. And there was like the people from kind of land. There was like the Catholic people. And we had like this priest that, w- that used to be, um, like a prostitute so it was just like the mix of people and religions and all of that was very different than normal per se uh but it was about just like us still promising each other to love each other for life and to lo- to give or not necessarily I mean because we can't promise that right you can't promise that you're not going to change forever but to promise that we'll try at least and that we will be there and that we are going to give everything we have to make this work in front of our families and in front of all of our uh, friends. So that is why we did it. And again, it doesn't mean, and it doesn't mean that my other relationships mean like less or that are less, it's just so different. And I feel so much love and I have felt so much love for my partners that, it, and it does not take away the love that I feel for my husband. It does not take away the love that, and the amount of work that I want to put into that relationship. It only adds in a lot of ways because then I am not expecting everything from him. Mm. So in that sense, it also takes the pressure off that it's like, you don't have to be my whole world you can be what you are and I can be what I am. And just like that, we're enough for each other. Mm. Kat, I'm going to throw this question to you. Someone says they have a a five-year-old niece who they told to wash between their legs during the shower and that the child said, my mom said, I'm not supposed to do that. And they want to know how to uh, address that with the mother about that. Was that for me? I'm, I'm giving it to you, Kat, and then anybody oh, else, okay. can, but I wanted to give it to you. Because I'm the old lady in the room with two grown-ass kids, what I understand. I also uh, thought you might, you might pull something. You might pull, <laughs> you might pull um, energetic, you know, you might pull something. <laughs> my first energetic things that I pull are common sense, because common sense ain't so common. And therefore I'm gifted in the area of common sense. (laughs) So (laughs) I wanted, when you asked the question and I'm also a Gemini, so I asked like a million follow-up questions. But, uh, oh, you're Gemini on your birthday. Day 30. Oh, wonderful. I'm Juneteenth. We'll talk about it later. The four of us will talk later. Okay. So so, um, one of the things that I would have done as a follow-up but I'll give it based on what, you know, most people could be thinking is what, what, what did she mean? Did she mean that she was told explicitly, right? Told that she shouldn't wash in between her legs, her vagina. The question I also have is what's the relationship between this aunt and the mother? Who said this? Was she visiting the aunt's house and the mother told her do not do something in front of any adults? Right. I mean, there's all these questions, but let's just say it was the thing that the mother told her not to do because maybe her mother is uh, the word I want to use is incompetent. Um, That's the word I want to use. But I'm, I don't even want to do that storyline because I feel like there's so many other implications, right? Other things we don't know. But in, a, in the case of if it's just the plain thing where maybe a mother is telling her daughter not to um, perform basic hygiene on her vagina, then the aunt should talk to the mother. The aunt should talk to the mother and then get the story straight. To me, that's what I would pick up from that. No, getting the story straight first, getting the story straight first. And I will say that, you know, one of the things I have very dry skin and one of the and I don't use a lot of soap, um, particularly on my dry skin. But one of the things my dermatologist said to me is to only use soap 
on the stinky parts. That would be vagina, anus, and the underarms. Now that's the only place that you that you use soap. Um, other ladies, do you all have a thought about how to bring that up to a relative? I do I think th being clear about what the instruction to the child was because children can be unreliable narrators. But also like going at it with curiosity, right? Anytime we're gonna talk to somebody about something that happens, like, hey, so-and-so said this, is this what you meant or is this? Because I think this to me reminded me, and when you said Tanya sensitive skin, like the bubbles caused so many young girls, so many problems, like that bubble bath that used to get put and it, it caused so many problems. And so I immediately as a mother thought maybe her mother didn't want her using certain types of soap or if soap gets up, you know, or irritates or there's so many things, but then if that's not it, again, I love that Kat was like, you know, going to somebody in curiosity, especially when it's somebody else's child and it's your sister, like that's a lot of like, just being real <laughs> this is a, through the black woman's lens. You're going to go to your sister about her child. It needs to be in a way that's, that's a little bit like, Hey, so-and-so said this, is this what they, cause I mean, I have babies like, you know, and just, and then, and then having that conversation or finding out what the mother's fears are. Like there might be something else going on. There might be some way in which the aunt can help the mother. Um, so I think all of those things. And then we have a question about um, black sexuality being monetized. And, in the, and that says, um, what do you think about black sexuality being monetized? Are we in control of our sexuality? or not in the media. And one of the things I wanna say to that is I was just at a conference with um, a Crux, and that's a um, people of color in uh, XR, which is VR and augmented reality. And um, one of the attorneys there said that she's working with a, a bunch of um, people of color, black and brown people who are sex workers. And they're trying to unionize. And, and I, my first response was like, would people do sex work if there was an alternative by which they could make a very good living? And one of the things she said to me is that sex work has drastically changed during the pandemic. And because it has moved online, people are making a lot of money and they don't ever have to touch anybody's body. And that one of the ways that we prevent um, protection happening for people who are being coerced and children who are being raped and tortured is by um, criminalizing all sorts of sex work such that we can't separate it so that those people who are legitimately uh, consensually engaging that that is regulated and they have rights and they have control and that you can separate that from people who are violently coercively harming other people for profit which is i'm told like the number one business in the world right now bigger than drugs and arms yeah i i was actually thinking about this question from a like what we see in music videos or movies or, um, so when I do tropes, one of the things, I, I use a lot of bell hooks work. And one of the things she talks about is there was sort of this huge push in the nineties and early two thousands um, in black feminist thought around what are the sexual tropes. And everybody was talking about music videos, right? And one of the things she points out is Justin Timberlake and Eminem do the same thing that the rap, like black rappers do in their videos, but they use Asian women, they use light-skinned Latino women, they use white women, and nobody's calling them, or very few people were calling them out in the same way that black rappers were getting called out. It doesn't mean we don't address the misogyny, but often it's like, oh, that's a black problem. And no, it's not, right? But then also like our sexuality is co-opted. Like one of the things I thought about immediately when you invited me into this conversation, Tanya, was how I felt when I found out that people were increasing their butt size because I had been shamed. I have, I'm Cape Verdean, like the women in my, my great grandmother, my grandma, we all have booty, right? And so, but I spent my whole life being told like, oh, that doesn't, you can't do this. You don't look, you know, that this is not pretty. And so then to see that it's suddenly like this thing that's being marketed, right? Or even bigger, like when lips first came out and it's like our sexuality is so co-opted and it's like, it's somebody said something like it's ghetto until white people discover it. Um, right? <laughs> like, and suddenly it's a thing you pay for. Um, and so all the ways in which, but, but even that is monetizing our bodies, right? This, I, 
my body is like this because I was born this way. I inherit, it's an inheritance from my mother and my mother's mother. Um, and so when I think about all of the ways in which something that is beautiful is turned into something that is marketed, right? And how dangerous that is. Or like living in Taiwan and feeling more beautiful than I ever had, even though I didn't have access to makeup because it was all skin bleaching and I didn't have access to my hair products, but nothing was marketed to me. And so getting to exist in a society where nobody was telling me there was something I had to fix, I've never felt more beautiful in my life. Mm. It is, yes, I was about to say something very similar because people ask me this a lot and going back to how people in America view Brazilians, because in Brazil, like in growing up, I was never the like hot one or the pretty one. I was kind of like the nerdy weirdo. Like I've always been that and I still am that. Uh, but now people are like, oh, you're so hot. And, and they have this thing of like, you're definitely like a 10. And I'm like, really? Cause I still see myself as a five. Cause I still look like everybody else in my country. Like mm -hmm. I'm like average. Cause what was considered beautiful when I was growing up was like the American looking girls. So like the blonde and blue eyes and the like big, <laughs> Yes. Yeah, yeah, but like, the, but the stereotypical American, the same way that there is the stereotypical Brazilian, like, it was like that, like Barbie look, and, um, and so like, I mean, most of my friends in Brazil have silicone. Most of my friends in Brazil started doing Botox when they were like 15, 16. <laughs> and they do like monthly sessions of Botox, and they do like straighten their hair, and they do all of the treatments because it is so common to be that like extra with your beauty and your and the beauty is such a big standard but the funny thing about it that I also want to point out is the fact that people even though there is this like somewhat celebration that people are talking now about black women and, and their bodies there's still a lot of um, I don't even know cleaning that happens like I guess is the it's the way to say it because you have like people are not used to seeing black vaginas like it is insane to me and the way that like if you wax or if you shave it is going to be that different color it's not going to look the same as a white vagina and like black dicks are so like popular per se in like porn on like what people are searching but the knowing of like what the black and brown body looks like it's not a very known thing. So even if you are capitalizing on the body, you're not showing the whole body. Like you're not actually like doing the educational part of it of like, yes, your armpits have different colors. Like there's like all of these things that, and then people get freaked out because they're like, but mine doesn't look like that. Like, what do you mean? Like, it's supposed to look like that. Mine definitely does not look like that. Uh, or like it's, you can bleach body parts right like mm -hmm. like no I mean or like reconstructing um like extra stitches or get like we always talk about mutilation in other I had a female doctor of color she wasn't black but she was a female doctor of color and I said I don't want an episiotomy and I don't want anything done and without my permission she put she literally said it was a husband stitch and I didn't <gasps> just I got pregnant with my neck but I was like something's not right right and it's like, if that ever happened to a man, <laughs> what would be the legal, but this doctor was doing it to all the, you know, so when you told your story, Beatrice, like every black woman I know who's given birth has some sort of horror story around treatment or around, um, and this is something I share with people, like they, they found in the US when a black woman gives birth with a black healthcare provider, so, or a black birth attendant, so a midwife or a doctor or a black nurse midwife, the rate of death for her and her baby goes down by two thirds. Mm, 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 mm. Third. That's so a lot. If we, and I think this does tie into like spirituality and sexuality because it's, it's, it's like black lives matter, right? Like mm -hmm. black lives matter. And so when you have somebody who understands that there's a different method of care, it's literally listening to somebody say, Hey, I'm about to give birth and not having the doctor leave the room like mine did. Right. But mm. the black midwife who stayed with me, who, when I said, look, my birth doesn't look like, you know, the typical that it's going to go real fast. And, and it's that it's literally just 
listening <laughs> to the women and understanding that they're competent human beings and that women know their bodies. So when they say something is not right, it's not going, oh, you'll be fine. Or it's, and I think honestly, there's a lot of doctors who think we're just supposed to be in pain all the time. Like when I think about how many women die of ovarian cancer and are told to go do push-ups or sit-ups yeah. happens as you get older, right? Or women have their, um, their ovaries removed without thought to like what that does to their hormones and their mm. hormones, right. Or like hysterectomies. And just- even birth control. Like I took, I was starting to take birth control almost as soon as I got my period as a way to control my flow. And for so many years I did. And I was like, this doesn't, after a long time, when I was 20 something, I was like, this doesn't feel right. Like something is off. And I stopped taking birth control and it was incredible the difference of my body just being out of it in the Mm -hmm. levels of like energy and uh depression and feeling like bipolar and pain Mm -hmm. like period pain and all of the and my skin got better my hair got better my sex got way better like Mm -hmm. all of these things that I was like hold on a second what the fuck was this thing doing to me this Mm -hmm. whole time that I had no idea that that was the cause I because everybody says well it's just that time of the month or it's just like it's normal to feel this way and it's normal and it's not it's actually not they uh they uh think we're super strong and superhuman and you know because you know of all the um negative connotations around our strength our resilience and things of that nature um once again a lot of things to unlearn But let me tell you something in regards to this um, sexuality being monetized. They've been doing that forever. You know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. It's just in a different format. Right. I mean, if you think about fashion. Right. In England and even here in America, the tight bustle things that they made. And so that it had a butt. It had the the little thing underneath so that it looked like it imitated a butt. Why? Like like the Venus. butt. yes. They were imitating our butts with their fashion, with their fashion, right? So this is nothing new to us, right? And and now, unless, you know, Cardi B and I don't know the names, Make the Stallion, Nicki Minaj, yes. Minaj. Nicki Minaj, you know, back in the day, Little Kim, Foxy Brown, that was a way um, to capitalize from a music industry standpoint. Now, if you own your whatevers and whatevers and you want to come out with a song, what more power to you? I'm down for that. You know what I'm saying? I'm down for the revolution. But at the same time, it's the same thing in a different package, you know, still being delivering dollars to the white man. You know what I'm saying? Um, oh, black sexuality's in now, you know, so let's... Uh, do some women empowerment songs that are really edgy, you know, well, and let's get it going. Well, I want to say what I like about a uh, WAP and Savage. What I like about them is that I feel like there's something about us as females that we are very, um, we, our minds um, and our imaginations are easily um, um, mined and controlled and, and, and that someone can talk us into many, many kinds of things. And that often, you know, with the R. Kelly, all these young girls that he promised he was gonna make them stars while he was raping them and taping them and selling the tapes. I like that these songs are um, removing that magic fantasy thing for the average young girl so that she has to think about, am I really just sex for this man? Because a lot of men, that's really all you are. And so I think um, making that clear is important. But then you have a Lupe Lupe Fiasco who has a song, Bitch Bad, where (laughs) he really talks about the difference between, you know, what little girls are seeing and what does bitch mean to them versus what bitch means when a boy hears his mother singing a song saying, you know, I'm a bad bitch, I'm a bad bitch. Um, So, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a fine line because we can't be in every kid's home and we can't even police homes and protect people in their homes. I wanted to say something that's something you said, Kaya. My last midwife, I, my births were all beautiful home births. 
um, only method of um, any sort of relief from any difficulty was masseuses. I did have a miscarriage where a female doctor gave me a DNC with no anesthesia. Um, but one of the things that my uh, midwife of my fourth child, who became my spiritual director for the next 25 years, she talked about how when you give birth, all the forces of the universe are flowing through you. And it is an opportunity to transform your life. And that no matter what science says, birth is still the ultimate mystery. Nobody knows but that mother and that child when that is going to happen. Your science can't tell you that. And that when um, a mother has to open her entire body to let another human being come out, and it's not going to happen if there's someone in the room that she doesn't want to be there. And if there's not someone in the room that she does want to be there, that that is the, the, the synergy of mind, body, spirit, that the body is waiting for the right time and the right conditions and the right people to be in the room. And I, I would, you know, gamble that that has something to do with those high mortality rates of um, melanemic people in the room when we are giving birth and not being in connection with that. Mm. Yeah. We got a lot of questions over here. I'm going to um, go to them right now. Um, Ooh, okay. Um, someone is asking about how black women are viewed in the corporate world. Do they think there've been changes since Anita Hill? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to go through all these questions so that you all have them in your mind and you can speak to what they are. Um, one, I'm going to say there's a, a great Forbes article. I will see if I can put it in the chat. I don't know if I can pull it up quickly, but it's about how black women often go from the pet to the threat in the corporate world. We come in, we are loved. Oh my God, you're amazing. You're amazing. And then everybody sees that we're actually more amazing than everybody there. And now we're a threat. And now the environment becomes very hostile for us. And we either are pushed out or we have to go because we realize it's going to be difficult, but I'm, I'm going to just get through these questions. So everybody knows what they are and can address them. Um, can we ask the women what gets them off? This doesn't have to do with sex but what enlightens their spirit. Um, then we have one um, about um, being molested at a young age. And so uh, all sex just became very meaningless. The act became meaningless. And um, I think this might be uh, a male. This question is coming from and they, they thought that that might have had to do with the partner, but they're saying that they prefer um, intimacy more than the act. And they want to know if that's a normal kind of thing. Um, uh, then we have a question from someone who is a, an older um, lesbian who was molested at an early age and once again also found adult sex. Um, I'm thinking they're saying penetration, not really meaningful. Can y'all hold all those questions and, and, and respond to them? I want to be respectful of your time. We have about um, 20 minutes left. So um, those are the questions that are there that anyone can address. Um, I don't feel comfortable responding to uh, most of those um, because, and especially in the work that I do, one of the um, gifts that I have is that I'm always telling people, I'm going to tell you what spirit is saying, but I want you to take this and take it to your therapist. Okay. Because sometimes people are not completely honest with their therapist. Right. And it can take years to get to where you really need to get to. So if like, if I was in a reading setting and someone asked me that I would, you know, divine it out. And then I say, take this specific issue and take it to your therapist. So I will leave that on the table there, but I did want to and talk if about- If someone was interested in having a session with you, how would they get that? Tell us. Oh, they could visit my web website, thehungrymedium.com. Um, but the enlightened spirit part, I love to talk about it. I do lots of things. 
that enlighten my spirit. Music. Oh my God, music. If you go to Spotify, Apple, you do the best of Miles Davis or you do the own chant or you do the Tibetan bowls, the way that music just and lifts, just lifts you up and enlightens my spirit, but also cannabis. I'm a huge cannabis advocate and um, the medicine, it's a medicine. Um, it's also a topic very close to the, the taboos of sexuality. It's spoken about in the same sort of ways, the same circle. So those are some of the things that help enlighten my spirit and take me to the, another level. But uh, I just want to put that out there. Uh, before I forget, just because I, I wrote a note for myself, somebody said, is it normal? I have, that is such like a triggering thing to ask to me. Because yes, whatever it is that you're feeling, it's normal. And I can guarantee that thousands, if not billions of people feel like the same in the world, maybe not related to the same thing. But if you're feeling, it's because you should be feeling those feelings. So like not to say, to say, is that a, like, do I need to better? And how can I better? How can I not feel this way? What actions can I take moving forward? Is a better question than is this normal? So if you're if you're sitting in that feeling and it, you don't like where that sits in you and you don't like what those feelings are bringing or you don't it bothers you that that you can't have uh, you know you can't have penetration or you can't have whatever kind of sex that you want to try to have then you can work towards trying to figure it out ways to get there but it shouldn't be your ultimate goal like if you're getting satisfaction and if you're getting pleasure and if you're feeling good about everything else there's no reason for you to try to get something that is only making you feel bad like there's no reason for you to go after that um so I wanted to just like say that because I, as soon as I said, is it normal? I was like, I hate that. And I know exactly what the feeling is like because I say the same thing often too. Um, and I say that to my therapist all the time. I'm like, oh, is this normal? And, and she's like, yeah, you're the most non like polar person in the world. Why are you asking me this? You know that, you know the answer. And I'm like, you're right. Uh, the whole getting off thing, I think for me, is a lot of, touch and dancing like I love physical contact so dancing and touch and um, eye contact and like being present like taking everything out and just being in that moment for me is a huge turn on to say let's put our phones away let's just be here and whatever here means that for me is like my main thing and like, again, physical, like exchanging that, like allowing yourself to feel and be, and be, uh, and have the feelings, like it's both uh, that, to answer that one. And then the corporate one, <laughs> that's a funny one. Uh, I've been in like management positions for the last, you know, 10 years in New York City. And I moved here young and I got my first management position very young. And I am a brown immigrant, cute, little Brazilian girl. And so I was managing a lot of man, and especially being like in the company management world and being in the general management world, there's a lot of crew, there's a lot of dudes. And you're also dealing with a lot of investors and producers that are, so you're dealing with like the crew dudes and then you're dealing with like the rich white man, uh, both which are, especially in the beginning, like I was very close, I was very afraid of letting people into my life outside of work because I am this very free spirited, like hippie loving person. And I was afraid that if people saw that they would take advantage of that. But I'm also very strict and very blunt. And I'm like, no, this is not like, I'm not someone that just lets shit roll. Like that's not going to happen. But for that, I was grateful for my first bosses who um, Lauren Scott from Briar Patch, who saw that in me and were always allowing me to say no and to like be a boss, like to let literally say, no, this is where I stand and I don't like it. I don't like how they are treating me. I'm going to say something. I'm like, do you mind if I say something? Because this is not okay. And so I started being like that and they were like, absolutely, do whatever you want. And there was um, 
there was a specific o- occasion, a, a person that I worked with at one point that said that I was too pretty, too young, and too much of a girl to be doing my job. And I'll never forget that because I said, how does that, how does any of those things change my level of professionalism and my level of knowledge? Like none of the things that you said, being too pretty is not a thing when we're talking about doing spreadsheets. Like, I don't understand how a, like, no sense. So has it changed? I think for me, one of my biggest missions, like in my career has been to give opportunity and to give space for especially brown women and brown people and I think there's like a few people that have worked with me that are probably watching this right now uh to be honest and not just white people but also young people that are being abused by their by their supervisors in one way or another and they don't feel like they can speak up or they cannot say something about being in that uncomfortable place Uh, and so I've been so for me now I am open and I am I will share my life with people that want to hear it and I mean I'm doing this thing and talking about sex as I probably have people that work with me watching this and there I gave up on like trying to hide that side because even to gain more of my own individual power and that there's still people that I don't think fully understand or they see like, oh, you're bisexual and poly, so you obviously want to fuck me, which is, again, not a thing. <laughs> and there is the, the, and the being in power and like in the corporate world, there still is the, especially when entering a new place, it takes a second for people to take me seriously. And there is still the thing where, I will say no to somebody or I will say I need you to do this. And then they will go to my boss and say, can I do this? And they, then my boss will go, what did Bia say? And they're like, they said that. Yeah, whatever Bia said. Like there, there is this thing. And I, every job that I have come into, I have been very clear. I was like, this is going to happen. I know this is going to happen. This happens every time, especially if I have a white man as a boss every single time. I know they're going to go to my boss to ask. Um, and my boss is always going to say, does it pass? And Dory Bernstein says, does it pass to be a test? She always says, does it pass to be a test? No. So you can't do it. Uh, so I've gained my space there to be where I am today, that I have people that respect me and that listen to me and that I can be this person and I could be this individual that I am. But I, but it's not like that for everybody. And I had an intern, which was this brown girl who one time, it was one of her first internships ever. And it was through a city program. And on her first day, she, she was doing something and she had her arm raised like this the whole time for like a while. And I was like, do, do you need something? She's like, yes, can I use the bathroom? And I was like, I'm going to tell you something right now. You should never ever ask permission to have any basic rights if you're if you're hungry if you need to use the bathroom if you need to go for a walk because you're overwhelmed you do not ask for permission you just say that you are doing so never ask and she said oh but in my you know but I'm I don't know how and I'm like never and I had never had a white intern are you kidding me? Some of these NYU kids would go for lunch that is supposed to be half an hour and come back two hours later. Mm-hmm. So, there, so that was like, and, in, and there has to be some education and there has to be some sort of um, role models too to tell them like, no, like it's okay. It's okay for you to go eat your food, take your break, say what you're thinking and share your ideas. Your ideas are valuable as well. If something is bothering you, please say it. We are at time. I want to give Kaya a chance to answer this. If you have to go, I understand. But I, I, if you could stay another five or 10 minutes to let Kaya answer this question, I would appreciate it. Is that possible? Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll be really quick. The things around um, abuse, one is, yes, please. Like therapy is great. I love therapy. Um, but also, 
I think deconstructing the idea of what sex is, right? And what intimacy is, and that intimacy is more than just, um, you know, even beyond penetration or beyond like, um, like genital stimulation that sex can be talking, sex can be like intimacy can be all of these things together, right? And so finding what that means for you and not feeling like you have to be boxed in to a certain, um, like a certain pattern. Um, when I think about, when I thought about like what lifts my spirit or enlightens my spirit, I love to be in community. Like Tanya knows, I have, I, I like two years ago said the majority of my work is gonna be with black women. Um, and it changed my artistic practice and it changed what I do and I love it. Um, and then I just think in the corporate world, like more sort of what you were saying, Beatrice, but more than anything else, like I think about sitting around a faculty table and having people discuss my hair or my pregnancy, right? Like I would never discuss somebody's bald spot at a faculty meeting because it would be considered inappropriate. If you talk about my hair um, or my expanding belly, like I, can I talk about your expanding belly? Probably not. I would probably be <laughs> told I was being inappropriate, right? So I don't think that's changed. Um, I, uh, but yeah, I just, I what, I, what I love about what you said, Bia, is that like, I think the more we can show up as ourselves, right? So the idea that to be professional, we have to imitate a, a, a white culture. Um, and I, I say white culture because white, there are white women who do it too, right? That we have to appear this way that we can't be, I work in community, right? There's a way I get my job done. I do it excellently. I'm really good at what I do, but I'm gonna do it like me. And I think the freedom that I found in that versus like, or button up shirt, do this, do that, do no, because that's not me. And what I'm going to bring to your organization is going to come from what I know and from what my people know and the way that we work. And I think breaking down that idea, I think that's starting to happen in the corporate world. And I think it has in the past. I am so grateful for this conversation. I could keep talking to all of you for many more hours, but um, our, we have come to the end of our time. Um, thank everyone who was listening in and um, Beatrice, I know we can find you at BPN, um, right? The Broadway Podcast Network. Kaya has a website, kayadunn.com. I'm at tanyapinkins.com and my movie Red Pill. Um, thanks to Crystal Chase who put all of this together. It was her vision she put through a Black Woman's Lens together and to HowlRound who is our host. I thank all of you for listening and we'll be back one last time next month um, doing academia. And so I hope you'll join us um, the last Thursday in October. And thank you again, ladies, if you will hold on after we uh, end the live broadcast to everyone out there, stay safe, wear a mask and, um, you know, enjoy yourself, spend some time exploring your body, hungry, hungry medium. Don't forget that you can uh, have spiritual sessions with Kat at the hungrymedium.com. And, uh, you know, I, someone can turn me on just with their mind. They are, know a lot about something and I can get quite aroused just listening to someone, listening to all of these women today talk about things that they're passionate about is quite erotic for me. So um, thank you and blessings to everyone. See you next month.